Principal consultant with Level, we're a consultancy out of Charlotte. We focus on DevOps, payments, and AI machine learning. Today we're going to be talking about the machine learning that we're working on. So before we get started on that, I wanted to talk about, I've probably built five or six products now, launching from scratch. I'm a big fan of Redis. I think it makes life a lot easier for everything related to PubSub, caching, and today we'll talk about the machine learning management aspects of that. I highly encourage everybody to check it out if you haven't. That's probably why we're all here, just because it's awesome. So what I built today, this is Red 10 under the hood. It's a distributed machine learning on-premise as well as cloud service. And it's focused on multi-tenant as well as uh, on-premise is really what I like to do. The ability to put it inside of a data center as well as deploying it to the cloud. It's all dockerized. Anybody, for housekeeping purposes, if you can't see the slides, I've actually got this hosted in a Jupyter notebook. So you can actually go to those websites red10.io slash intro, if I get this working, and then slash forecast will be the part two. We'll take a quick break between the first part and the second part. First part is an introduction, kind of going over the high level of the machine learning aspects. Second part's gonna be the technical deep dive where we go into like a use case. So under the hood, I've also got a, a gigantic set of appendices if you guys wanted to check it out. I try to document everything. I love documentation. Jupyter makes that stuff easy if you haven't used it before. So let's get into it. So why did I build this? I'm a big fan of stock market analysis, so specifically buying and selling entry points for opportunities, and the ability to profile that using machine learning is what we'll be talking about today. And so if you're gonna have an objective, Redis was used for this purpose um, because databases and RDBM, RDBMSs, Postgres, MySQL, even the NoSQL databases, aren't really a good use case, and I'll talk about why here in a second. But under the hood, I was like, Redis makes sense for everything I've ever had to give it from PubSub to caching. It just handles it, scales it, and doesn't crash. So I was like, this is gonna be a great use case for it. So if we're gonna build this cloud platform, I wanted to have the ability to change my data up, I wanted to make new predictions, change up my models all at the same time, and share it with a group of my team. So I got buddies on the East Coast, guys on the West Coast, and we wanna share that Jupyter notebook to be able to execute code, <laughs> build new models, change our data, and make new predictions. Eventually deploying into real-time systems so you could actually make live stock trades if you wanted to. So under the hood, I'm a huge DevOps fanatic. Love Docker. Everything in here that you're gonna see today runs in Docker. I've actually Dockerized the Python client as well. But under the hood, it's all about orchestration and automation to take what do you want from a data perspective, build the models, create your forecasts, your analysis, get all of that together, Compile it together, throw it into S3, and then you have an archive, a backup. All of it gets backed up. And then from there, you can deploy those artifacts individually, whether you exported them out of the Redis servers themselves, or if you pulled them down from S3 for some kind of historical back test that you wanted to run. So as we get into this, um, before I even start going down this, I like the idea of pre-trained models. I think building models from scratch allows organizations, especially my team, to be able to build something where the data is secure. You got it behind a firewall, and you're doing the analysis, you're crunching the numbers. Maybe you got HIPAA data, maybe you got patient identifying information. Keep that stuff behind the firewall. I think a lot of the cloud offerings today, you have to expose your data sets to their systems. And that compromises some of that data security and that, that integrity that you as an organization can preserve. The focus of using DevOps for machine learning allows me to build models in an environment it, pull them out just like a Lego castle and plop them into something else. And so that you can't reverse engineer these things. After they've been trained and built, your data is no longer a threat to be exposed to any of that security vulnerabilities as you go outside of the firewall. So you build in-house where the data is secure, locked down, then you can export somewhere else. Maybe it's an IoT device that has a minimal footprint for memory, computation resources, any of those constrained environments. You could build a model, extract it, throw it into that kind of system. That's, that's why I love this stuff. So before we get into this, this is the intro deck. What is machine learning? It's really simple, everybody It's super hyped up these days, but it's an algorithm for navigating data. The outcome of that process is a model. It's the artifact in software terms like developers, like we're all working on artifacts and build processes. The artifact is the model, and how it learns is the algorithm. And this, this is the Quora, you can read about it, I include the links if anybody's curious. So if you were building it, I think of this stuff as visual. I'm a huge visual learner. And so, let's pull up that little that guy. Whatever that little thing was here. 
So if you think about the data as a tree, I think of it as a three-dimensional image, and the data you can navigate in many different ways. And so hypothetically, if this is your best area of predictive success, high accuracy, low error rates, how do you get there? Well, you're starting from the bottom, and every time you set up a configuration for your model, you're gonna end up with a different outcome, a different <laughs> artifact. And that's what makes this stuff super unique and why relational databases that we think of, the NoSQL databases that we think of, isn't a good use case. So you can go through many different combinations, permutations, configurations. So the first one, hypothetically, let's say it goes, you want it to go top and go straight to the top of this tree, this data set, and navigate to the best area. Well, the first configuration shoots off to the left. The next configuration, again, shoots off to the left. You can configure these things very differently every single time you run them, and every single time you're gonna end up with a different outcome, a different artifact. And every time you get it, maybe this one goes to the right, this one goes up further, maybe does a loop in your data and doesn't learn anymore, and ends up getting diminishing returns. Eventually, you're hoping for that ideal configuration where you have a simple pathway straight into your boom area of good success. And that's what this, this whole focus of this Red 10 architecture is about streamlining. How do you find the ideal configuration? How do you build highly tuned, quality, very predictive, and cost-effective models and be able to extract them and move them elsewhere? And all of this is powered on Redis. So Redis as a machine learning data store, I wanted to be able to take large, these are like gigabytes of data that I'm building in these models. As they learn, the intelligence grows a mass. I don't know if that's a term, intelligence mass, but that's what I think of it as. They become megabytes, gigabytes in size. And so you've got huge data sets, you've got huge model files. And so you end up with the use case where going to the database is too slow, especially if you're trying to do this stuff in real time. Like imagine putting this in an IoT device that needed to predict health outcomes like during surgery. Maybe you're doing like for the stock analysis, you're trying to do it with real time predictions, with real pricing points. You can't go to a database because it's too slow. So you need an in-memory cache, some kind of solution to be able to take that and say, hey, we built it, we're confident in the model, let's make predictions with it. And that's the workflow that's here. So under the hood, I came up with like core responsibilities and requirements of what I think about it. First one up, I want to be able to enable my data set to change. Number one, that's the biggest thing you're going to screw up first out of the gate. Changing the data, changing your features, which is a fancy word for columns in our spreadsheets, and then adding rows. That's all this stuff is. And so it's all a spreadsheet under the hood for all this stuff. So you're compiling a data set, you're changing it, and then you're trying to figure out the ideal configuration. And you're trying to tune these things so that you can have the ability to deploy them somewhere else. And so the idea here is that you're trying to build an API. That's how I approached it. I wanted a REST service. I got tired of the original manual version, and so I was like, I need a cloud service to take all of this and make the workflow just a bunch of REST calls, just like everything else on like AWS that you use. So under all of this, uh, I found out the biggest constraints are naming conventions, naming schemes so that you guys can run models, you guys can run models, I can run models, and we don't collide. And that's kind of the focus of the naming system that I've put in place here, is that the collisions are based off of like the data set name, user ID, job ID. And that, that apparently prevents any of these collisions with the in-memory models, so that everybody can be co-located in the same environment and be building the same, working on data, I can work on the same data set or a different data set, iterate, 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 iterate. And it's a productivity tool here. So eventually, after you've built these things, you're confident in them, you wanna make new predictions. And so I expose an API to make new predictions with my pre-trained models. And so that allows me to have this simple REST service that does my build, my train, my predict, my import, and my export. That's all of the life cycles that I've needed so far. And eventually you can get the forecasts and the analysis, and I'll show you guys what that looks like here in a second. Um, I'm a big fan of Redis. That little point right here has made my life awesome. Like six and seven, stability, like scaling is easy, and then RDB snapshots. I don't know if you guys use that as an artifact tool, but the ability to save what you built to a file, export it, you've got everything in memory. And so what would you use it for? Well, for Redis and the, the conference here, I was like, I'm gonna push it and see how far the system can go. So I put 10,000 machine learning models into Redis with this system. So it's a REST service that allows me to iterate on different data sets and just spam into the system. I just did a gigantic for loop and let it run for a couple days. So what you have is the outcome is a REST API to train data, systems, and models, and then store it for export and all that workflow, all downstream. So you can get it down into like a production system that doesn't have any of the data issues, the security aspects that you gotta worry about. So this is it, this is what it looks like. This is a Jupyter Notebook, um, proof is in the pudding. We're at a developer conference, so I'm like, hey, I gotta show people the code, what it looks like. So this is 
the baseline, which you have to import, like literally it's copy and paste, you're authenticated into the REST service from there, count up the iris, and then the five tickers I like to profile. They're ETFs, really simple, and then count them up. Use the Redis CLI. You probably don't want to write a keys call, but that's inefficient, but it doesn't really matter because it's a demo. But under the hood, count up the total. And so this is 10,806, I think is when I took the snapshot. It's well over 13,000 now, just based off what I've been iterated on. But under the hood, you have all this stuff in memory, all these pre-trained assets that you can then use somewhere else, and you can look at like the predictive success. Maybe this set was good at accuracies, maybe this set was good at low error rates. And that's kind of the focus of this, is figure out from an exploratory perspective, automate all of it end to end, and look at the final outcomes as artifacts. Treat machine learning like DevOps. So this is an action. So it's a long GIF, so I'll probably give a couple rounds through this. What we're doing here is this is the EC2 instance uh, that I'm running it on. It's eight cores, so this worker is actually training right now. So it's pegged right now doing jobs while I'm saving a snapshot. So I'm actually looking at the Redis machine learning database. There's two DBs here. There's the Redis MLDB1 and the Redis caching server for pricing information, caching, celery for the actual pub sub, and under the hood, a database for Redis. It's only machine learning purposes. Everything is artifacted and stored there. So under this, you can see in the bottom right, it actually does the keys and the info. Proof is in the pudding, right? Like I'm not up here trying to like be hype machine. This is actually the simple commands. Like I run keys, count it, there's like 11,000, and from there, save it on the other terminal. So in action, this machine, it's uh, 15 gigabytes. I'll show you guys what it looks like when you try to do in a more constrained environment when you deploy this stuff. But under the hood, this is the save operation. It takes a, a couple seconds, and then you end up with 10,000 plus machine learning models in one single file. You can then move it anywhere. You can then share it. There goes the save. So now we went up like 11 megabytes. So why would you use this? What's well, a productivity tool, right? And so data science as a profession is pretty new, at least in the ecosystem of jobs that have existed. So this is kind of the conceptual seven steps that the workflow exists right now. This might change in a couple years from now and be dated, but it's really about everybody has the same first one, whether you're an engineer or you're a data scientist, figuring out what's gonna make the product better. How do you build a data set to help you make those predictions? Whether that's collecting data from silo A, silo B, maybe it's accounting and subscription and e-com, smash them together, build a data set. Now you've got a data set you can start iterating, adding features, again, just columns, and adding a couple new rows to the stuff. And then from there, start making predictions. Start figuring out, hey, if I kick it off and I configure it with that first configuration and it starts navigating that data set, how far up the tree it gets, am I getting into a good error score? And be able to work backwards and say, how do I tune these things better? As a data scientist, they're gonna be looking at what algorithms they implement, which ones they choose, there's so many out there. Today we're talking about just the machine learning, not any of the AI, none of that stuff. Just really simple AI, or really simple machine learning today. And so under the hood, pick your algorithm, tune it to make it better by itself, so you can tune the data, and you can tune the algorithms and the models themselves. Both are independent of each other. And that's why you need a system like this to be able to, to iterate quickly and make the workflow simple. And so from there, deploying it. So taking what you've got in a, a non-production environment, ripping it out, and putting it somewhere else. And then that allows you to actually have that artifact, that pre-trained, that intelligence, deployed somewhere else. Hopefully so you can keep iterating that non-prod, right? Like, <laughs> keep the data scientists moving. And so that last point, this one I think is gonna be interesting as we move forward in a couple years, regression testing. Like, data science is so new, how do you look back a year ago and say, hey, my models have gotten better. How do you quantify that? How do you make sure those accuracies are better? As I change my data, it's grown like from 500 columns wide and like 40,000 line or 40,000 rows into like 50,000 rows as well as like 700 columns. You start adding more, but how do you know you're getting better? And you gotta have a system that lets you track that stuff. So that's what I was like, I gotta be able to look back in time because I guess I'm just OCD about it. But that's kind of the generalized data science workflow. And so I built this to make myself and my team more productive. So I hit that. So the ecosystem. <laughs> it's a fun time in machine learning. I think there are a lot of applications for it. But right now I feel like it, there's a lot of hype. I feel like everybody's talking machine learning this, AI that. They're driving cars, they're flying spaceships. Like all this stuff is going on in the world and it's great. But there's a lot of hype. And the perception definitely isn't the reality. 
So I don't know if you guys are on Hacker News, but Kerbal Space just got bought by Take Two today. I'm a big fan of it. That's indicative of how I feel about machine learning. You build, I don't know if anybody's played it, but like you build a rocket ship, set up all the parameters, give it the fuel, the mass, the rockets, you're gonna launch it. And then it explodes in some violent awfulness. And that's how my life is with the, the initial builds of the machine learning ecosystem. And I'm always like, okay, well it's definitely not me, it's definitely the data. Like, <laughs> And so from there, let's talk about the tool chains. So we talked about the difficulty between the perception and the reality, the implementation. And so I'm a big fan of easy to use. So that's an automated car and it's driving this guy. That's how I like to build products and make it simple. It needs to be simple, otherwise it'll never find adoption. And the other side of this, this is the Endeavor space shuttle cockpit. You could spend a lifetime. That's a PhD's career spent in machine learning. All the bells and the whistles for how they navigate data that's a career path unto itself, and that's not what I'm here to talk about today. That itself is a very complex solution. So today, what could you use it for? So let's say you didn't have a spaceship that exploded on takeoff. You had something that was working. What could you predict with it? Well, you could do pricing, you could do forecasts for accounting, user events for how people are navigating your tool, whatever that website was. You could be using it for risk analysis. You could be using it for insurance, biotech. It really comes down to can you express your data in numeric values, that's it. If you can put it into a decimal point, or if you can put it into an integer, whole number, that's all you need to do the stuff. And then from there, be able to remove those, those columns and those rows that have strings, non-data that's non-numeric, be able to pull it out. But the takeaway, I hope, is just put it in numbers. If you can put it into labels that are integers, that's simple enough. So if you were able to say, okay, we got data we wanna use it with, what algorithm will we pick? So when I started like back last year, I'm like, hey, I'm gonna become interested in data science and start going down there. Kaggle was a really cool resource. They just got acquired by Google like a few months ago. I was like, well, who wins the Kaggle competitions? For people in the room who don't know what Kaggle is, it's monetary competitions for data science. So if I was able to compete against everybody in the room as a heads up competition, who can build the best models? And there's money on the line. So who won those? Well, more than 50% were won by XGB. Extreme gradient boosting is winning most of these things, at least in 2016 it was. And so from there I was like, okay, I know what type of algorithm I want, what's the implementation that I want for navigating the tree? And so from there, linear regression seems to be the industry standard as the starting point. So I have my two entry points, and then I could start iterating in a notebook. What you see right here for the, all the slides on this is actually Jupyter, and then rendered as HTML inside of a website. So you can build your own notebooks and share them as websites. But I, I just think it's really cool, especially like a presentation like this. So how does it work? Let me make sure I scroll down. So this is Stack Overflow. We can't have a dev conference without talking about Stack, that I live there. And so from here, this is March 1st of this year. Somebody's asking a very reasonable question. Why does one configuration take, I don't, I don't know if everybody can see it, why does one configuration take a minute and then the second configuration takes 30 minutes? And that's because as they navigate that tree, like you're not gonna go straight at the boom, the good area, the good predictors, high accuracy, low error rates. You can have different configurations and you need to be able to experiment with those configurations with a system like this. And that way you can navigate that tree better, more efficiently, and be able from an OpEx perspective, be able to say, hey, how much compute resources are we gonna need to build some kind of quantifiable quality model? So this is what the brain looks like. This is how you set up the genetic makeup of XGB it has an infinite amount of combinations, right? And you don't have an infinite amount of time, so you need to be able to quantify how much do we want to throw at this thing. And so from there, being able to set reasonable boundaries, limits, limitations of how much you want to compute within this kind of parameter. This is the constructor. It's, you can go as far down that path as you want and make your data sets or your models as big as you want, bigger than you can actually keep on your machine. So if you build all that, how do you support it? Well, it's pretty painful. Um, that's super perfect for how I feel about it most of the time. It's like you take a new update, a new bill gets released on GitHub, and I'm like, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna add this pip into my Python stack, and it, it just falls apart. So if that's not breaking it, you're overflowing your memory. So the first one on EC2 that I was doing for the Redis comp for this to get to 10,000 models, I put on an eight gigabyte machine, four cores, I was like, okay, this will be great and I ended up crushing one of the poor workers. The celery task just killed itself because it ran out of memory. I was like, okay, great. So I need to put it on something bigger. I'm gonna need a bigger boat. I don't know if anybody else likes JAWS, but like, that's how I feel about it. You gotta give this stuff more memory, more compute power. It's a time-intensive process. It's a compute-intensive process. 
What if you change your data for this conference and make something flashy? Well, you, you can really screw up your data. As my wife's got a PhD in psychology and she's like, garbage in, garbage out. And that's how the stuff is. So this is me trying to predict uh, one of the tickers that I'll talk about later with a new data set. So I added like 50 new columns to this thing and made it gigantically worse. And so being able to evaluate my starting point was at A and it was decent. <laughs> I added B and made it exceptionally worse. So I created my own flash crash indicator for the stock market. Completely worthless. From a time perspective, building the data made it worse, so I wasted my time there. Iterating on my algorithms here, I wasted time. And that's kind of the stuff I'm trying to mitigate with this approach. So this is from XK, or yeah, XKCD, that little comic strip. It's super sarcastic. It's about stirring the data to make different predictions. And while it's super sarcastic in nature, it's actually super true. You think about that data set, right? It's a tree. Every time you run it, it's got a random probabilistic wandering inside of it. So it's going to be different, like empirically different, no matter what with this stuff. So you're going to end up with different data. The takeaway on the slide is that you don't need a lot of data. Like You can make pretty high quality predictions with predictive data more than like junk data and a lot of it. And that's, I hope, the takeaway from this kind of talk is that the more predictive you think your data is, the better the models that you can have at the end of this as an outcome, an artifact. So how does it work? Well, the first version I released on GitHub, super manual, and it was about the DevOps ecosystem. I just wanted to take things, build a model, make it predictive to a baseline accuracy, extract it, put it somewhere else. And that was the workflow I was on. Nothing more than like what our Jenkins builds do to create some kind of Java, like a war file, artifacts, and then move it somewhere else. Store it in Nexus. That's all I did. So the first version's all about that. And so I called it SidePipe, it's on GitHub, it's for free. Anybody can check it out, feel free to give feedback. And then this one is the new cloud service. So I moved to the West Coast, um, my team is on the East Coast, the guys I work with on this stuff. So I needed to be able to share this collaborative environment. And that's why I had to build it with a cloud service, because I got tired of uh, running code on their machines. So this is SidePipe, this is uh, the manualness. So the first part is developing your models putting them somewhere, I put it in Redis Labs online cloud offering. So I thought that's pretty cool that they offer that. So from there, I wanted to extract it and put it somewhere else. And so I, I went with S3, because Amazon does everything pretty, pretty awesomely and well and super scalable. And then from there, take it and deploy those, those intelligent assets somewhere else, those models, those pre-trained learned things, and put them on a different environment. That's where the pricing systems were. Uh, a much bigger machine is really what it was. And so it was hooked up to actually have like real-time price ingestion engines to actually make predictions in near real-time. So that ecosystem, that workflow, that's what the original version was. Now it's on this, which is, I should have added a REST API client is here now that's on GitHub too. If you wanted to check it out, it's actually got a Docker container too. But under the hood, it's nothing more than Jupyter. Notebooks, just like this, presentations in Jupyter. Sharing that, collaborating, changing our data, or changing our models, and you're throwing it over the fence into AWS to do the, comput the computation. Granted, it's AWS, but everything's Dockerized. So the whole thing could run on-premise inside of your secure firewall, whatever you want. Maybe you don't want to throw your data out over the fence into the WAN. You could run it there, too. So where could you use this? So under this, this like slide, I feel like I could have labeled as many things as I wanted. These are the major players in the space. So it's, again, everything that's numeric, you can use with machine learning. So whether it's banking, fintech fraud, analysis of like user data, from there, biotech. I think of like, it would be so awesome to work on something that actually tried to help predict cancer with genes and actually sequencing of like healthcare data. I think the idea of insurance is in there as well. So if you wanted to say like, this person has a pre-existing condition X, Y, Z, you could use that to predict stuff and take more accounting books and have more budget allocated based off of what patients are having their data set. You could have marketing. So I think of like MailChimp. I think of that email subject line whenever I try to launch something and I screw up the message. We'll have a predictive data set with my A-B test to have like, hey, the email subject's just messing you up. You're not getting your open rates because you're not having a good prediction success rate. And that's the kind of data set you could set up and have make predictions to make your email campaigns more effective, your drip campaigns. From there, you could have telecom. I think one of the cool things about machine learning that I haven't seen yet, maybe it exists, GitHub's a big place, but the idea of having open source machine learning models to help defend your technology. And I think that's gonna be the next iteration is open source models that people can actually have, like, hey, if I put my Google Analytics, my Nginx logs, or my Apache logs, and I feed it into this data set, have a model that we as a community, as the developers, we could share, and you could deploy that asset into your infrastructure. It could be version just like all of our software systems. I think the mobile apps, if you have a REST API, 
you can make predictions with it. If you want to do travel data and have like sales forecasting data, you could use it with that. Maybe you've got some travel thing that's going on in Australia going down and like the Great Barrier Reef's having a great year and travel prices are skyrocketing. You could use it to make predictions about that kind of stuff, like situational, seasonal, any of those little indicators. So before we get into the next deck, uh, do you guys have any questions? This was the intro. <laughs> <laughs> So I have a question about the performance characteristics uh, or requirements for those REST APIs that you have for training the models. So like how, how fast should they be? Yeah, time is going to be a factor. We'll talk about that in the next deck. Okay. So depending, there's a trade-off between quality, like the speed you want to finish it at, and the cost. And that's the, the trifecta you got to like ration off. Like you got three legs of the triangle and you can't get all three. And one of them's gonna bite you, whether you're paying for a super trained, super expensive model that takes, the ones I run take about eight hours. And I'm building 30 of them per stock I wanna go. So you're running into a huge scaling problem as soon as you go down into the second deck as we go in there. But you can, you can ration it back and say, hey, if I wanted to have an IoT device and it's got limited resources, maybe it's only got like, I don't know, 30 megabytes of memory. It's gonna be sitting in a field somewhere in like Montana or something. You could put a machine learning model that was crafted for that environment Export it out of this, throw it into memory, and you could have that pre-trained asset ready to go, and no one's going to be able to reverse engineer it. But again, it takes less time, right? Like you can build them in a minute, or you can build them in 30 minutes. You can build them in hours or days. Like the, the new stuff that like ResNet has takes like two weeks to build, is what I keep reading about. That's a long time, and at the end of it, you've got this gigantic artifact of intelligence that you got to worry about moving around. So it'd be like, what use case do you want to solve? And then we could work on which one do you want to iterate? Do you want to sacrifice quality, or do you want to increase how fast they get built? And that's the, the trade-offs of it. Um, I want to ask, uh, what's unique about Redis that is so important to your stack? Great question. So Redis, I went with a, a MySQL database the first time, an RDS instance. And so my RDS was a, like a, a large, like I think an M1 large was the original one I was using. And I tried to store eight gigabytes. In the second deck, I'll show you how big they, well, it doesn't show you how big they get, but they get to eight gigabytes. The 30 models that I build, they're all limited to like five, 12 megs. And then you got six of them and they're compressed. So you end up trying to pull out gigabytes of data out of MySQL or Postgres or even Mongo. And Redis just, crushed it. It was just like seconds versus like I had to wait a minute, as well as I had to share the resource of the database, right? The MySQL one's always the, that's where the bottleneck is for my infrastructure, the way it's got set up right now, is the database is always my, my slowest contingent. So I try to put everything in Redis, whether it's that right through caching model, that's what I use for everything. Everything goes into cache and I keep the database as low, low impact as possible. So I'm always, I'm always looking at ways to throw things into Redis. <laughs> to get around that, that use case, the constraint of the system. So in my experience, the sizes of the models can be extremely large and you know, it just depends on your application and use case, right? So why would you not store them in like a blob-like storage? Like what, what makes it an interesting scenario to store the model itself in, Red, in Redis? I can understand parameters and all the metadata and that's all very good. Yeah, the idea I'm using right now is I wanna be able to make near real-time predictions with the system. So I use Redis as an in-memory solution. So blob storage is great, and I actually use S3 to back up everything. So that now I've gone through a whole year of doing this stuff. Now I can look back at the blob data, download those old ones, and compare them against the new. And say, A, B, who was better? Maybe I was better last year than I am this year. And so blob storage has become my archival storage solution, as opposed to the deployment solution, which is all Redis now because it's just super fast. So we talked about using Redis as a machine learning data store. Well, why would you use it? The original use case I had was to be able to do SPY forecasting. So I don't know how many people trade stocks. I find it fascinating that you can use mathematics to try to identify a condition where it might make a good time to buy or sell. And so under the hood, this is TD Ameritrade, but what it is is a channel. You got an upper bound of probability and a lower bound of probability. That becomes what reasonably it should land. And so from there, I was like, why can't I automate it? And I was like, well, what can I automate? And so this, this panel right here, it's a math formula called a Bollinger Band. And it's nothing more than trying to give you a math signal for when it's a good time to buy and sell. So I was like, oh my gosh, this is a great use case because it gives me a math formula that I can put a label on and make it an integer. And so if I could do that, could I do it with multiples? And so the Ichimoku Cloud is the one here on the bottom. And that's the first one I've seen out there that actually does forecasting into the future. 
as a technical indicator. Maybe there are more that exist. This is a whole discipline to stock people as they invest. Technical analysis is a whole discipline with volumes of text. And so I'm trying to like figure out, can I forecast the movement of a price into the future like they're doing? So that was kind of the incarnation, the origination of the idea, the genesis. And so I was like, well, how would I do this? Well, everything in the stock market is five pricing points, right? You got a high, a low, an open, a close, and a volume. That's it. That's everything in the stock market, and that's what you're trying to predict with. So you got five parameters, and then you're trying to forecast six different dates. Five days, five business days into the future, so next Wednesday. Two Wednesdays from now, 10 business days, 15, 20, 25, 30. Six weeks of physical time into the future. And could I do that with machine learning? And that was the origination of this whole process, was could I forecast a system just to figure out where the high and the low should fall, right, for each of those. So with that, could I build an iterative workflow that allow me to kick off these jobs as new information came in? Maybe I'm hooked up to like the Yahoo pricing or a TD Ameritrade or uh, the exchange brokers, interchange brokers, IB, and then go with this as a solution to hook up to a pricing engine to make near real time price, like price predictions and actually trade with it. From there, I was like, can I automate it all and build a data set? <laughs> the original data sets, I mean, right, it was like 300 columns wide, now it's like 500. From there, it takes like seven hours to build a data set. That compilation step alone, and I'm trying to do five stocks, that compilation step is more time than you have hours in the day. So you've automatically gone into the, the, the area that you have to scale, period. Otherwise, you're never gonna finish anything and you'll never end up uh, being able to make near real-time predictions. And so that's kind of the origin of it. Uh, technical indicators, I think, are the coolest representation, at least I know to date, of how do you set up features, those columns, inside of a data set. I've, they're built to do nothing more than analyze the five pricing points and come up with a buy, a sell condition, a label that you can put into an integer notation. So it was like an immediate fit for a data set. There's also fundamental as well as social. Each of those has their own signals that you can build off this stuff and derive. But at the end of the day, make it a number. So why would you do it? Well, talked about the scaling. This stuff took way too long to build the first time. It took me like a week just to get it down into like the hour time frame. And so from there, I was like, can I get uh, the ability to improve my models? That was one of the things that's always been a hallmark. I'm OCD about it. Can I keep improving iteratively and make consistent improvements with percentage point gains? And that's always the stuff I'm going for. I wanted to have a service layer for implementing model abstraction. <laughs> so XTB is one. I've got six other ones that are plug and play. Spark, TensorFlow, those are the ones I want to bring on next. But under the hood, abstract how the model is working and then combine them will be the future. So I could have an XGB configuration one, two, three, and have model chains that actually define an aggregate, an ensemble, I think is what they're called now, ensemble learning for combining multiple models together to build a prediction. And so that's what the techniques I'm going for. Under the hood, always focus on team, collaboration first. So everybody here can make predictions, you guys can make predictions, make models, change data, and I can make predictions, change models, change data. No one steps on each other's toes, no collisions. And then address the security story, because I feel like machine learning in the cloud's great, but you gotta expose your data. So I was like, if I can keep my data and build a system that lets me run it on-prem, then I could have the ability to, de to deploy assets, those intelligent mass, somewhere else. So the takeaway on this one, that gigantic build process, the data set, and the 30 machine learning models that took like eight hours each, <laughs> down to 30 minutes. And now I've got a set of well-defined, which, what are the best? I know exactly what models are good, like which ones are the five pricing points, which ones are accurate. Each one of those is only deployed into the Redis servers to do the pricing predictions. Now it takes about five minutes to hook it all up. So what does that cost from an OpEx perspective? You're talking about $126,000 for the salary range of a data scientist, according to Glassdoor this weekend. This is a 70x improvement, at least in the data set size. Uh, so it's a productivity tool. Using something like this makes your data science team more efficient. And that's exactly what I was going for, is to make those guys faster at it. So how good are you? Well, this is what it is. So this is when I got the, the okay to come here and talk about this that anybody cared. I got, I was like, all right, I'm gonna take a, a screenshot because this is one of the coolest ones that's happened. So what you see here is one ticker, five days into the future, and predicting the blue line is the historical, and the multicolor line was my predictions. And so what you ended up was a divergence. And this, it's pretty common actually in the stock market to use like divergence and convergence as a way to say, hey, the signal's gonna, they're gonna eventually collapse and they'll converge at some point in the future. And that's what, that's what the machine learning's telling me is that when all the signals are above or below the line, they're gonna eventually converge. And that's one of the coolest things I've seen from this as a takeaway. 
But under the hood, this is the accuracy. So back in like the end of February, early March, I noticed that spike. And I was like, oh my gosh, everything's going down and the, the price went up. And I was like, this is gonna come back. And I was like, I knew it was gonna come back and I was like, I'm gonna take the snapshot of what happened in the future. And so this was the forecast. I was like, it's gonna eventually converge at some point in the future. And so as a stock trader, you could Im immediately go with a sell opportunity with this. And so that was one of the cool takeaways. It's like, I'm gonna talk about this today. So how do you get started setting this up? It's all Jupyter, right? So the code itself, copy and paste, you log in automatically when you run that code. Anyone who's used Jupyter, it's cool because it combines a markdown, so you can actually document while you execute your code as you run these things. And now they've even got this, this slide deck support so you can come do cool talks like this. So from there, configuring the job. This isn't even set up for the, like the stock market. That's what I love about this stuff, is if you can configure your job, you name your data set, what columns you want to predict, what values are in the predicted columns, like for me, Good, buy, good, good time to buy, a bad time to buy, and it hasn't finished yet. Those are the three states. Those are just integers, right? From there, can I set time series up inside my data to be able to make five days, 10 days, 15 days, all the way out to six weeks into the future? And from there, be able to, to take those models and make predictions with it. So one of the questions was, how do you assess the, the speed, the time it takes? Well, this is it. Setting up the brain of XGB right here you have your trade-off, the trifecta of this little triangle. You've got quality you can go for. That's going to cost you more money because it takes longer. You've got quality, you've got speed, you've got costs that you've got to worry about. <coughs> so as you start to ramp up, remember that infinite configurations of how it can navigate the tree? As you start to ramp up the configurations to say, hey, keep stepping and keep making predictions here, it increases how long you have to run it and increases the size of the model. That intelligence starts to grow and accumulate into a bigger file. So from there, you can build smart models. They cost a lot of money. They cost a lot of time. Or you can build simple models, like stuff that you could deploy on an IoT device. The last talk that was here was talking about Redis on microcontrollers. I would love to put Redis with machine learning models that run in constrained environments to make predictive analysis. Like that, that sounds amazing, that you could have a device in the field that you have a footprint and a limitation you could put a predictive system into. And that's what I like about that, is like, there are reasons why you would want to have a different type of model. And this is how you would do it. So again, more Jupyter stuff. Uh, it's named, that I named the data set the SPY. It doesn't have to be that. It could be like accounting, it could be banking, it could be fraud. And then what columns are we predicting? So I got your future close. Might as well use the, the laser. You got your future close. I'm building the other five with it. And then from there, what are the, the labels? Like goodbye, bad buy, finished. Those are the labels that are gonna get applied to it. Um, and then from there, the time series, which are down here. And again, it's just for forecasting purposes, the prediction system. I've actually got the IRIS data set as another slide deck if you guys want to see it, if you wanted to use the straight up predictions as opposed to the forecast. The nuances are a little different. And under that, setting up the brain. So this is how you configure the brain. So this is nothing more than wrapping the constructor of XGB inside of a REST call. So I could use JSON with this. So this is a simple configuration, right? 50, this is the, the number one thing is the num estimators, if I can highlight it with the mouse, that's probably easier. The number of estimators. That's the most sensitive one for how big these things grow, at least with XGB. Each one of these models has their own way of learning and how they navigate, and you have to be able to tune each parameter differently. The three big ones are the num estimators, the max depth, and then of course the objective. Like I'm using red regression linear algebra, like this is it. And from there, setting up the job is done. You can change each one of those parameters with a rest call and just like figure out all of your price points from a cost perspective as well as like how long is it going to take to run it? And at the end, throw it in the new prediction row and then firing it off. So now that you've got your job configured, let's start the forecast. Again, there's very little here that's tied to the stock market specifically. It's a bunch of labels. And then I wanted simple, I actually skipped that point, simple delivery of the results. So it took hours to crunch all the numbers, come back with the results. I use simple email service off of Amazon to give me 30 images that I got logged through, 30 or 35, something like that now. But under the hood, give me an email option so that I can review the data when it's done. And that's what I hooked up as part of this API. So from there, authentication and then run the job. So from there, it's an asynchronous job processing platform. So you get, just like you go to the coat check at a restaurant, you check your coat, you get a ticket back, the ticket 556, that was the job ID for this one. And now you've got your reference point to start waiting for the job to finish. So as you're waiting, I like Caddyshack, so I threw it in there. It's like a funny little gif, yeah. so I didn't have to wait too long. It takes about 90 seconds for them to run. But Red 10, what is it? It's the Redis 10 steps for machine learning. 
And so under the hood, you could see as this waited, each of the states was going through, you end up waiting for all 10 to finish, then you're completed. And you end up with a gigantic payload. We can all have to go through it if we wanted to, but you end up with your same job ID and everything as artifacts to S3. So these are the analysis. Those are hosted on S3 right now for public. You could also lock it down if you wanted to use it with a private bucket, right? So under this, you can go back and say, okay, we finished the job, we waited for it, maybe we kicked off 30 of these things, and we went and go grab lunch. Let's go get the automation analysis. So this is the, the analysis from the, the computer results under the hood, not visual. So this is actually, oh, it's so small. This is a data frame, I don't know how many people use pandas, but under the hood, it's 556's five, five, results to go back and say, hey, this is the future open, one of those five pricing points, 10 days into the future. And from there, show me the accuracy, show me the mean squared error. There's also chi squared if you wanted to use that too. Under the hood, those are your two parameters for how you assess predictive accuracy and error rate. And so from there, I wanted to see a simple data frame, give me what it was, what the dates were, and what the predictions were. Each one of them, each one of the 30 is in here. Again, it's just parts of the data set, right? That got, you, you set up what you wanted to do to the data set, it slices it up, it collapses the results, and this is what you see. You could go through it line by line, but under the hood, let's get into more images, because that's the, the fun stuff. So that was the automation analysis. From a computational perspective, you could like very simply start to filter your results that way. But what if you wanted to manually inspect it? So it's one line of code, it's gonna go out to S3 and import everything straight into the Jupyter Notebook. You also use pandas from the command line, but you end up with charts. So what you see here is the blue, I don't know how, if you guys can see the blue line, it's kind of faint, but the blue line is the actual predictions, or sorry, the historical price, the red line is the predictions. And so each one of them, I can look at from a chart perspective and say, do I have confidence in what it's trying to tell me? And as a human, it's very different than looking at the automation results, right? Like accuracies and error scores, I might miss something. I might screw it up. But charts, I understand. And so I overlaid price, whether it's volume and it's a straight integer with the number of shares, or it's price, that's the Y column. X-axis was date. That's all I did. I just overlaid each one, each of those little data frames, drew them as pictures and threw them into S3. The coolest thing about this was, this is why I love to iterate, is the volume. And the volume in here told me I don't have to allocate as much money <laughs> into building this stuff. So this is the volume chart. So let me scroll up so you can see the title. This is the 10-day volume. I think the 15 is even more accurate. This is pretty indicative of what I like to see. The red line is on top of the blue. So if you get that, like that tells you, hey, the volume is pretty sensitive. It's aligned with what you're trying to predict here. And that's what I like about this. Now, I can trade off, I don't have to put high quality volume models together because of this, this actual conference. Now I can actually run it with less. I can run less number of estimators. I don't have to build a mass intelligence for volume anymore. Because now I've seen it, now I believe it. And so seeing is believing with this stuff. Like I need to see it visually before I'm gonna put any of my money on the line, right? And so each one of them is in here. All 30 get collapsed, and you can even get the forecast image if you wanted to see it to the future. So, I think I jumped ahead, but if you wanted to look back, say you kicked off 30 and went to lunch. Now let's go back and look at, well, what are the accuracies? So you go back and say, hey, go get the machine learning jobs, simple REST API call, and you end up with a gigantic payload, right? So 556 at the top, each one of them gets dropped into your hand so you can look at it piece by piece and see which of the 30 jobs you liked. Which ones do you want to extract models from, which ones were the best, and compare A to B, A to B to C, all the way out to 30, 40, 50, as many as you wanted, right, it was like 10,000 models, which ones are the best. So, we talked about the manual piece of this process, the original version was SciPipe. SciPipe taught me, hey, you really gotta figure out how to decouple large, uh, the blob storage, that question in the back. The blob storage case, I had to decouple eight gigabyte files with headers. So it was really simple, right, like, I say it out loud, and I, I, I laugh at it because it's how simple it seems. Break out the analysis, the predictions, all of the numbers that you care about from the intelligence. And decoupling that from the header made it super easy to compare. Because now I don't have to go to S3 and look at those keys that are gigantic from a year ago. I can actually just say, hey, go get the header and start to compare headers against each other. And those are like megabytes. And so by decoupling large intelligence from the analysis, the accuracies, the error scores, and the predictions, I use it as, I call it a manifest, the prime many terms for this. Under the hood, it's a dictionary of the deployed Redis locations where the models were, each one of them. The S3 archival location, so you can go back and say, hey, 
Let's go download that one, and maybe we'll extract it and put it somewhere else. Now go into it and have it in a dictionary form that I can go in and say, hey, no collisions, right? So you can have the ability to deploy this to a different system. And so I focused on deployability uh, as well as just automation end to end. And so for this, I wanted to make sure I had a manifest that I could redeploy and just say, hey, download the manifest and deploy the whole job back into memory. And so that's what this is, is a deployment manifest. And it's all about decoupling. And I wouldn't have known it until I started to go down this rabbit hole. So what does that look like? Again, it's all JSON, right? And this is not the super sexiest stuff. Under the hood, this is the model manifest for what you're getting back. Redis location, number one top, S3 location, SLOC, and then the tracking identifier, and then what the model name was. So open at the top for 10 days out. And then from there, what does it look like? So I'm not logging into the system right now. Probably be too nervous anyway, but under the hood, I'm looking at the naming of the, the model, going into the Redis database, logging in, and just running the keys command. So I'm looking at the 30 models in memory, as well as the predictions and the accuracies that are stored there, and just pulling it back out. So watch it again, because I probably went too fast. But under the hood, this is verification that like this is what the deployment of the manifest matches up with what your API is giving you back. And so from a tracking perspective, this makes deployment of this super easy. There's an import command if you wanted to run it as well, so we could import existing models from a year ago if we actually wanted to. So as we start to wrap up, I wanted to, to kind of emphasize some of the bigger points. The big one, you can do this stuff with any data. I think if you can make, your, you make it numeric, you can use machine learning with it. I think that's one of the coolest things. You don't need a lot of data, you just need predictive data. And that's the only way you can tell is you actually have to try it. So you gotta iterate, and you need a tool that lets you move quickly with it, and then enable your data science team to be able to change the data set, as well as the models, independent of each other. So with that, streamline it all. I wanted the whole thing to be able to build, train, predict, create the analysis, and send it as an email so I could wake up in the morning and look at what happened. What did it tell me? From there, take those models and the accuracies and improve it over time. I wanted to make sure that the stuff I did last year <laughs> isn't better than what I'm doing today. And that's, you don't know unless you're actually tracking this stuff. And so I was, I was like, okay, I need a tracking system. And the tracking system led me to make sure I didn't collide with users over here, users over here, and myself. As so I allow my team to change things. So with this approach, you can work with any data. You can make predictions with any of those systems up here that we talked about, from banking, fraud, risk, healthcare, biotech, marketing, any of that stuff you wanted to use it with, your mobile apps for predictions, because it's got a straight up API call, your authenticated travel, and from telecom, if you wanted to actually look at the actual traffic over the wire with streaming information, you could have models there. And so with that, we start to wrap up. I want to say thanks to Redis for being awesome. Again, another use case comes to mind. Pub sub, caching, and now machine learning model management is a great use case for this. I think it's made a great story from a scalability, stability perspective. It's always the one piece of my infrastructure that I never worry about. I don't know if it's the same with you guys, but it's like the one thing I don't touch and I don't have to worry about it because it makes everything else easier, especially when I'm trying to launch a spaceship. <laughs> and with that, thanks for listening. I'm Jay. <laughs>